Good morning and welcome to High Ridge Missionary Baptist Church, where we're growing in our faith, relationships, and community. So are we blessed and highly favored this morning? <laughs> Amen. It's so good to know that God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. I heard that this morning and I just thought that was so true. So let's continue to pause, reset, and ask the Lord to restore us in this season of Lent. And if you haven't already, please share, like, and subscribe to our channel. Whether you're here in person or tuning in with us online, let's all put the distractions aside and focus on Jesus. So he's, he's already here, so we just got to let him in. You are now here from the praise team. Good morning. This is the third Sunday, um, well, last Sunday was the third Sunday of Lent. Exodus 17, 1 and 7. The whole Israelite community broke camp, set out from the sin desert to continue their journey as the Lord commanded. They set up their camp at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people argued with Moses and said, give us water to drink. But Moses said to them, why are you arguing with me? Why are you testing the Lord? But the people were very thirsty for water there, and they complained to Moses, why did you bring us out of Egypt, Egypt to kill us? our children, and our livestock with thirst. So Moses cried out to the Lord, what should I do with this people? They are getting ready to stone me. But the Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of Israel's elders with you. Take in your hand the shepherd's rod that you used to strike the Nile River, and I'll go. I'll be standing there in front of you on the rock at Harrow. Hit the rock. Water will come out of it, and the people will be able to drink. Moses did so while Israel's elders watched. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites argued with them and tested the Lord, asking, is the Lord really with us or not? The Israelites learned a powerful lesson during their time of wandering in the wilderness. But God not only liberated them, but also journeyed with them. As you think about those Abraham-like moments, when you pull up stakes and follow God to who knows where, the good news is that you are never alone. Thank you, Jesus. The God who is with us always journeys with you. Can you think of a time you were aware of God's witness on your journey? What did the realization mean to you? How did it urge you to keep going? Then, today, is the fourth Sunday of Lent from Samuel 16, verse 1 Samuel 16, 1 and 13. But the Lord said to Samuel, have no regard for his appearance or stature because I haven't selected him. God doesn't look at things like humans do. Humans see only what is visible to the eye. <laughs> but the Lord sees into the heart. Do you remember that magic eye picture that used to be popular they look like a big blur of color and shapes. But if you were to concentrate, an image would emerge. When the picture became clear, you've often hear someone exclaim, I can see it. To be honest, I could never see what I was supposed to see. It always looked like a blur of color to me. In today's reading, Samuel is doing something not unlike staring at a magic eye of picture. He's trying to discern who might become the next king of Israel. Initially, he gravitates 
toward candidates who look the part of a king. Yet God tells him that it takes more than looking the part. It will require a certain kind of heart. Part of the journey of faith is learning to see, isn't it? It's about focusing our vision on that which actually matters. Because some stuff don't matter. That which has the potential to transform us and as a result, the world around us. Today, embrace this prayer in your interaction. Give me eyes that see beneath, behind, and below the surface. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Can we just give God praise? Come on, how many just tell the Lord thank you? All over the building, just tell them thank you. Thank you for just making the way. Thank you just for the, the early sunrise. Thank you that I made a wake-up call because many people didn't. But to God be all the glory. So we're going to say welcome. We're telling the Lord welcome into this place. Talking about welcome into us. And if we're honest with ourselves, we're a mess. Without God, we are a mess. We are a messed up people. But God's grace and God's mercy, if it won't for that, where will we be? So we're going to say this song that says, welcome into this place. And as we sing this song, just think what you want the Lord to do for you. Welcome into this place. Welcome into this broken vessel. sing. Oh, 
offer up his praise unto your name. As we offer up his praise unto your name. Come on, let's give him praise. Let's give him glory. Let's give him honor. Why? He deserves all the praise. He deserves all the glory. He's worthy. How many know he's worthy? This, this offer up right now. He's worthy of all the praise. There's none like you in both the heavens and the earth. There's none like you. As we, as we offer up this praise into your name. Why? Because he's Jehovah Jireh. He's Jehovah Nisi. He's Jehovah Rapha. As we offer up this praise. As we offer up, as we offer up this praise unto your name. As we offer up, as we offer up his praise unto your name. He's the King of Kings. As we offer up, as we offer up His praise unto Your name. Nobody like You, Lord. As we offer, as we offer up His praise unto Your name. As we offer up His praise unto Your name. To God be the glory. Ask you to stand your feet at this time. We'll have Sister Diane Florence to come with the scripture, followed by Sister Sherry Foster with the prayer at this time. Matthew the 26th, starting with the 6th verse. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, to what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she had wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. For in that she had poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily, I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman had done, be told for a memorial of her. And let the word of God richly dwell in our hearts. And I'd like to leave you with a thought. You don't know the cost of my oil. We come to you this morning thanking you for life, health, and strength. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here one more time, gathered together in your house. God, we thank you for all your blessings that you have restored upon us. And Father, as we go through this service today, Lord, touch, heal, and restore, Lord. And Lord, we ask for blessings 
to the speaker for today that she may leave us a word that will continue us on the path to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. It's giving time. Amen. This is where we all can participate. We're not setting a fee, but whatever God lay on your heart Amen. to do, Amen. you do that. Now, we have an extra plate this morning. We are approaching queen season. Queen pageant. Queen pageant, excuse me. Is our queen present in the house today? Stand up, Ms. Shireen. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> this will be High Ridge's queen this year. So those who want to participate, we're not asking you to, begging you to, but the middle plate right here is to help our queen in the queen pageant coming up the Smith River. Okay? So let us bow for a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for each heart that's in the building. We ask you to bless this offering, bless those that have to give, bless those that don't have to give, that on the next appointed time, you will bless them with something to give, that it may be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom. For it's in your blessed name we ask it all. Amen. Amen. Well, we ask you to please stand and be directed by the ushers from the rear, please. Well, good morning. Is anybody thankful about being in God's house on this morning? Oh, are you truly grateful for being in God's house on this morning? Let's just shake, shake, shake ourselves up a little bit because some of us are a little uptight. I know you may be a little chilly, but just kind of shake yourself a little bit. God's been good, and we're here this morning to share in his grace, to share in his love, and to praise him and uplift his name. And if you're not ashamed to give God some glory, won't you stand on your feet and just thank him and praise him and give him your best praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. To God be all the glory, honor, and praise. I am so, you, be, you may be seated, I am so deeply excited this morning to have my friend and sister here to share with us on this women's history they celebration to God be the glory. 
who hailed all the way from Greensboro, North Carolina. She flew in this morning. I'm just joking. I'm just glad to have her. So her aunt is here that's going to come and introduce her at this time. And after we have the introduction of the speaker, we'll have another selection from the choir. I'm sorry, the praise team. And the next voice you will hear will be Sister Latanya Wiley. Amen. Good morning, High Ridge. Good morning. Good morning. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here on this beautiful, beautiful God-given day. I want to give uh, honor to your pastor. I want to give honor to your deacon, saints, and friends. I want to give honor to God, most of all, for being who he is, especially in my life. I also want to give honor to the first lady. Um, I, first lady? No first lady? Well, she coming. How about that? How about that? How about that? But I have been chosen to do a task that is very, very, very easy for me. I've been chosen to introduce the speaker, none other than uh, uh, Sister Latanya Raquel Wiley. And she does live in Greensboro, North Carolina, but she is originally from Burlington, North Carolina. She is the only daughter of the only one in Reverend Otis Wiley, which resides at Bethel Fellowship Church on 163 North Church Street. And she is uh, the daughter of the late first Alice Wiley. Um, uh, she is my niece, and that is her uncle that is sitting right there. Uh, his name is Derek. I just want to just say, um, Latanya is a very, 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 very anointed woman. And I'm not saying this because she is my niece, but we have to give people their flowers and we have to be honest and we have to be truthful about the things that we know to be true. Amen. Saying all that to say this, Latonya is a very anointed woman of God. And I will uh, also say this, wh whatever the Lord um, uh, asks her to do, she will do. She would do. And, you know, sometimes I, I look at her, I admire her, because sometimes we're so quick, it's so easy to say, no, nah, I do it, let somebody else do it. But she always takes on the task. And I, I really thank God how he is working in her life. I could stand here and give you all the accolades of the school she went to or the accolades of the master degrees that she had. But guess what? That's not important. That's not what is most important, as, the, as I heard earlier spoken in today, is her heart. This woman has a heart that loves God, and I thank God that she loves him. So I ask all of you that, that have came out today to hear the words of the Lord. Don't look at Latanya, but look at the, what God has put in her heart and what God has given her, her to speak to us as a people, because I do know without a shadow of a doubt that she does have a word from the Lord. So I ask that you will open up your hearts, your minds, and your hearts and sit in need, because I don't know about y'all, but I came in need looking for a miracle, for a blessing. So I'm hoping that all of y'all came the same, uh, same for the same reason. So I present to you Sister Latanya Wiley, um, High Ridge uh, Baptist Church, um, Sister Latanya Wiley. As y'all can tell, I'm not used to doing uh, introducing people, but I did my best. But um, I will say this, Latanya, I am so proud of you. I have always been proud of you. And I know God is just, he's very, very proud of you. So again, High Ridge Church, Sister Latanya Wiley, Sister Latanya Wiley, High Ridge Church. Oh, I'm a 
Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. You can call him up and tell him what you want. If you want your body healed, tell him what you want. Oh, now if you need your soul say Tell him what you want Now if you need your soul say Tell him what you want You can call, call him up and tell him what you want I get joy when I think about What he's done for me I get joy when I think about What he's done for me I get joy when I think about what he's done for me I get joy when I think about What he's done for me You can't tell it, let me tell it yeah. What he's done for me If you can't tell it, let me tell it, y'all What he's done for me If you can't tell it, let me tell it What he's done for me What he's done for me He saved my soul That's what he won He saved my soul That's what he won He made me whole That's what he's done That is what he's done That's what he's done He gave me a walk That's what he's done He gave me a walk That's what he's done A new talk That's what he's done 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 That is what he's done That's what he's done I get joy when I Think about what he's done for me. I get joy when I think about what he's done for me. So much joy when I think about what he's done for me. Oh, joy when I think about what he's done for me. Stand in your midst once again. I give honor to your pastor and my friend, Pastor Niblet, to every heart in the building. I honor my aunt and uncle. Thank them for coming with me. You know, it's, it's you don't ever want to go anywhere by yourself. So. <laughs> but when your father's the pastor, you can't bring him with you, right? So he's conducting service himself. So I thank them for coming with me. Thank her for that beautiful introduction, but I wish she hadn't put me up so high because there's so much further to fall. So, man, I thank God for being here with you this morning. Thank you for the invitation to uh, bring a word this morning. So today, uh, we are talking about Women's History Month, right? And uh, when we talk about history, we're always talking about men. We always tell the story skewed from a masculine perspective. And we celebrate those men when we talk about the history of our country. We always talk about the great founding fathers, right? But we forget that those founding fathers had mothers too, <laughs> right? We forget about women, right? We celebrate uh, great icons of the civil rights movement. We talk about uh, Dr. King. Right, He was an iconic leader in the civil rights movement. And we always remember that great speech that he gave. I have a dream, right? But nobody ever talks about Reverend Prathier Hall that he borrowed that line from, right? It wasn't Martin who had a dream. It was Reverend Hall. And he overheard it in a prayer that she gave one day repeatedly saying, I have a dream. So he thought he borrowed that in that great speech that he gave. But then we also forget that it was Sister Mahalia Jackson who reminded him, oh, don't forget you had a dream. You would have never heard that in that speech on the Capitol had she not reminded him. When we talk about the great leaders of this country, we always talk about Franklin Roosevelt. He's such a great president, right? 
But we forget that he was the one in the wheelchair, but it was Eleanor who was really wielding the power behind the throne. We're going to talk about her story today, telling her story. Now, when we talk about history, I'm a fan of etymology. I love the origin of words. I want to know where words come from because we know in America's language, we borrow other people's, other cultures' words, right? And then we grotesquely manipulate them and call it English. So I like to know where words come from. And we know that the word history actually is derived from the Greek word histor. Simply means to know. And then they manipulated that word to historia, meaning to inquire. But in the America's adaptation of that word, history simply means to know. It's gender neutral, but again, we always talk about history from a male perspective. But today, we want to tell her story. I want to lift a passage today coming out of the book of John. In the fourth chapter, around and about, the, um, well, let's get the 29th verse. Now, we know this is the story where Jesus meets the woman at the well, right? He's on his way traveling, and he finds himself there in Samaria, so he stops by the well, and he meets this woman, a Samaritan woman. And in his discourse with this woman, he begins to tell her, everything she had done and ask her for a drink of water. But in doing so, he offers her this water that will be everlasting in which she'll never thirst again. And after her discourse with Christ, the Bible says that the woman left her water bucket. And in verse 29, it says that after she ran into the city, it says, come see a man who told me all the things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And then they went out of the city and came to him. Come see a man who told me everything I have done. He knew her. Remember, we're talking about history. And the root of it simply means to know. He knew her. When we talk about stories, history, actually, when we kind of break it down, histor simply means story, right? To know the story of. And when we think of stories, we find them where? In a book. And I offer you today that our world is nothing but a grand library. And our God put us here as books to line the shelf. All of us are walking books with chapters and pages that tell the story of who we are. But it's up to other people to read it. Now, some people like to read their books on an electronic device, but I prefer paper. Something about the feeling of turning pages. I like to go to old bookstores and smell old leather and knowing that the pages are worn because they carry so much history. And I like to read because I like to know. But when I begin to think about this, let's talk about what books are made of. Books come with a cover, front and back. But inside are the contents, the story within, right? Now, some people, unlike me, I like to go to the bookstore or to the library, and I like to find plain hardbacks. I don't need pictures. Give me the title and give me the content, right? Let me read it for myself. But then there are some books that come with a dust jacket. You know what that is? That paper folded, it covers it. And usually on the dust jacket, they have all these beautiful pictures and images that kind of illustrate the story within and then on the back of the dust jacket is a brief synopsis of the story. For example, Danielle Steele. Now, I know I ain't the only one here used to read Danielle Steele books, right? <laughs> Danielle Steele books, I love them because the covers were so rich and colorful, beautiful people on the front of the cover. And it wasn't until I 
took a moment and, and reading this probably I done got about 12 books under my belt and I realized I'm reading the same story. <laughs> they just got the different people on the cover. Same story, different cover. And the way they create these dust jackets is to make it appealing, right? So you want to read the book. And so they illustrate one small section out of the book and magnify it. And then on the back, they take that one section and, and break it down. And you think that that's what the entire book is about. They don't tell you you got to get to chapter 32 before you get to this scene, right? But they pull out that one little bit of information to bring your attention, to attract you to the story. But I want to talk today about just give me the cover. Cover versus content, right? We talked a little bit earlier today when they were reading the scripture about Samuel trying to choose the next leader. And everybody said, this one don't look like a king. This one don't look like, this one don't look. They were looking at the dust jacket. Ooh. But it wasn't until they found the one that God spoke and said, that's the one who was looking at the content of the book. And I want to challenge you today, consider cover versus content. Some books are frayed at the edges. They've been worn. Pages might be wrinkled. Some might be torn. Doesn't mean that book has weathered some storms, right? Those are the types of books I like. I don't like crisp pages. I like worn out pages. But when we talk about women and telling their story, Women, I think, are the most complex creatures on the planet. A woman's story, <laughs> a woman's story is complex. Our stories come with chapters and dispensations of time in our lives. We are complex. You can't choose one chapter in my life and define who I am. That's what happens when people look at your cover. They determine that they know you. His store to know. They determine that they know you because of what they can see. When I think of women who have influenced me, my mind automatically goes to my mother. God rest her. I thought that my mother was the most divine thing that God created next to himself. She was elegant, she was poised, she was beautiful. My mother, though, had a particular interest in caring for her clothes. She always made sure they were hung up neatly, they were folded, pressed. She was very careful with her clothes. Rummaging through her closet, I noticed that she always had paper, stacks and stacks of Ink pens. She had an affinity for ink pens. Always had no less than 30 in her pocketbook. I promise you it's the truth. <laughs> but I, as I got older, my mother began to open herself up and share with me. And at the end of her life, she began to tell me more about her story. And the more she talked to me, shared with me, and told me, I realized, I don't know this lady. I don't know you. I knew mama. But it wasn't until she told me her story that I knew Alice. I only knew one chapter in her life. She hadn't always been mama right? There were chapters in her book that happened before I even came into existence. I didn't know her. But it was around that time that we would go to different places and we would run into people that she went to school with. And I'll never forget, we ran into this one lady who recognized my mom and my mom spoke to her. She said, Alice, it's so good to see you. And she looked her up and down. And she said, it's good to see you, too. Well, I said, you're doing well. You look good. Thank you. God is good. Well, I'll be 
seeing you around. Sure. Well, as she departed, I said, well, Mom, it's so nice to get to see some of your, you know, school friends. And she turned and she said, that woman is not my friend. And you know me, girl, what happened? <laughs> so, but this when she began to tell me her story. My mother grew up poor, fourth oldest of 11 children. And as she began to talk about her experience with this particular woman who thought she was my mother's friend, she began to tell me out of their poorness how this woman and her friends would pick on her and bully her at school. How their clothes were frayed and tattered and old hand-me-downs or some things that her mother had managed to sew together. She told me about the day that she had went to school and she put on the only coat she had to keep her warm because it was cold. And as she put her hand in her pocket to warm herself, she discovered that the rats in their home had made babies in her pocket. And they laughed at her. She recounted that how she asked this girl to borrow a piece of paper. And the girl said, why can't you get your own here? And she flung a sheet of paper in her direction. And it was then that I understood why my mother was so particular about her clothes. Because she hadn't always had nice things. And she was grateful for what God allowed her to have. I understood why she had stacks, and I mean stacks of paper. Because after that girl picked on her so much and humiliated her so much, she determined I'll never be without pencil or paper again in my life. I did not know her. I only knew mama. One chapter. But in turn, the friend that we ran up on as she looked her up and down was amazed at what she saw. Because I can understand now that as she looked at my mother, she was expecting to see that same poor girl from high school with ragged clothes, without pencil or paper, always in need. And she was surprised to see the woman that she had become. And the lesson that I took from that is in our stories, when people choose to read our stories, don't you know there are some people who will choose to leave you at one chapter in your life and never choose to read what happens next? Some people will leave you stuck in a chapter in your life where you are in need, where I'm broke, where I'm desperate, where I'm hungry, where I'm without. some people in your life right now who are still holding you in chapter 5 and God has already brought you to chapter 27 they want to hold you there they think they know you because they know you from chapter 5 but they don't know you too many times women sit in judgment of other women and we decide who a woman is because of what we can see for example, let's go back to the word. There was the woman that was caught in adultery. And they brought her and threw her at Jesus' feet and said, ought we not to stone her? Isn't that what the law says? And the word says that Jesus stooped down and began writing in the sand. I don't know what he wrote. I don't know. But I can imagine he wrote the names of the men who were standing around with a rock in the hand who was just with her last week. I can imagine he was writing in the sand a checklist of the Ten Commandments since y'all want to live by the law. How many of these have you broken? Amen. They brought this woman out of judgment, but nobody knew her story. They didn't know her story. She was caught in adultery, but nobody asked, how did you end up here? Nobody wanted to know. They didn't read the chapter in her life where she was molested. Nobody read the chapter in her life where every man that came into her life only used her for her body. So in her mind, she's been taught that my body is my only currency. 
We judge her by what we can see. But you don't know her. Let's go to the woman at the well. She came to draw water in the middle of the day. Why? Everybody know you go to the well at the coolest part of the morning. So why is she there at high noon? To escape other women. To escape judgment from the people who thought they knew her. See, let me tell you something about a story. Because I've been there and I know y'all have too. When I was in college, I had this knack, despite the fact of loving to read, they gave me too many books at one time. So I discovered that if I read the first sentence in the chapter and the last sentence, I can make up what happened in between. And do you not understand that there is somebody right now who has made up some chapters of your life? Made it up. Because they don't know you. They didn't bother to read your story. It's just like this woman at the well. She escaped these women coming at high noon because these women talked about her so bad. And then Jesus sits there and tells again, I know you didn't have five women and, and, and husbands and the man that you laid up with right now ain't even your husband. I know. But the one thing we should point out, Jesus never condemned the woman at the well. Was he sitting in judgment? No. He told her what she had done because he knew her. I don't know about you, but I can guesstimate and surmise that maybe Jesus wasn't sitting in judgment of her because he knew, unlike the other women, she had five husbands because three of them died. Two of them divorced her unjustly. Back then, men could divorce a woman because the meal wasn't right. It was beyond her control. And back in those days, women depended on men for survival. This woman was doing what she had to do. But these other women didn't know her story. They never took the time. So when, when she came to the well before, instead of jeering at her and making fun of her and laughing about her and criticizing her, nobody stopped and asked her, tell me your story. And friends, that's what's happening in too many women's lives today. People make up the story. Because they don't choose to get to know who you are. People make fun of women living in a homeless shelter with their children. Why don't you do better? You'll get a job. You can do better. And they don't understand that that was her better. Because living in this homeless shelter with my children... It's safer than being at home with their father that was beating all of us every day. You don't know their story. You don't con cover versus content. You looking at the outside and not, not even taking a chance to read the pages of a story. You don't know her. You don't know the conclusion of a person's story just like you may not know the beginning. But you got to know. Now, I want to talk about bias. We prejudge people, deciding who they are based on the color. But I'll challenge you just like Peter when the Holy Ghost had to speak to him one day. He had decided who the Jews were and who the others were. These people, they nasty people, Lord. I don't, I don't want to sup with them. Didn't he say that? And he fell into a trance and it said that the Lord sent a something like a sheet that dropped down in front of them. And when that sheet opened up, it was all types of animals and cloven husks. And I, he said, Lord, the Lord told him lies. Kill and eat. Peter said, Lord, not so. I ain't about to do that. I don't eat none of this stuff. It's not clean. And God told him right there, who are you to say what's unclean? If I call it clean, who are you to call it unclean? I go back to that woman at the well. God didn't call her unclean. God didn't sit in judgment. Because God looks at the heart. Content versus the cover. He doesn't care about our outward appearance. 
because some of you are wearing dust jackets today. I look good on the outside, but I'm tore up on the inside. I got on a dust jacket that illustrates chapter 13 when I was doing real good in my life. But I'm already living in chapter 30 where things are kind of rough right now. But I got on this dust jacket to make it appealing for you. Cover versus content. Tell your story. If some of you sitting in here right now, your husband don't even know who you are. children don't know who you are. Truth be told, you don't even know who you are. See, I'm a fan of rereading stories. I like to go back and read it again. And every now and then, I have to go back and read my own story so I could remember where God brought me from. Because sometimes, like other people who like to hold me in a chapter, I find that I hold myself in a chapter. Keep myself stuck when God already delivered me. And I'm still worrying about what if and how can I and when is this going to come. And God has already made the way. I'm already worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. Stuck in a chapter. What all I got to do is turn the page. And this is what's wrong with some of us today, especially as women. We don't turn the page. We want to stay stuck sometimes. We allow people to keep us stuck. You let people keep you stuck. This is what they think of me, so this is what I must be. Not so. I am what God says I am. You remember me when I was in want, when I was in need, but you remember me before a time when I discovered a God who said, I am the great provider. I am that I am. You remember me from a, t- from a time before I discovered a God who said, my grace is sufficient. Stuck in a chapter when all we have to do is turn the page. My God. Telling your story. You don't write your own story. Did you know that? When we come into Christ, it said somewhere in the word, I am the author and the finisher. And that's the beautiful part about it. When we become children of Christ, I don't have to worry about writing a story. I'm living in a story, a script that was already written for me. You understand that. So I do theater partially for a living. And I love it because every time I get a new show, I become a new person. They give me a script and I read this person's life and I begin to emulate what it says. I become a different person. And then I begin to realize I'm living in a script that God has written for me. And every other chapter or so, God allows me to evolve into a different version of myself dispensations and time periods. Do you not understand that your life mirrors the Bible? God told us we need to learn to rightly divide the word of God. And the problem is there are some people in your life who have not rightly divided you. They still stuck in a dispensation way back here. You've moved on. You got to tell your story. So I encourage each one of you today, women and men, take inventory. Go back and dust off your dust jacket. Take it off and see the cover plain as it is. And the 
begin to read the content of who God says you are. And realize I'm not stuck in these old chapters. Look where God has brought you from. I used to have a habit of walking like this. Hunched over and I would keep my head down. Nobody ever understood why. And I would keep walking like this and somebody would talk to me. I'd be good. Afraid to talk to people. Nobody understood why. And then one day... I realized, why am I walking like this? And I realized, and I, say, I can see this as a moment of transparency for me. I'm a domestic violence survivor. And I realized that I had kept myself stuck in that chapter. I'm still walking around because I'm afraid he's going to say something. I'm still walking around not thinking anything of myself because of what he said and not realizing and understanding God delivered me out of that chapter already and I had kept myself stuck there. And when I realized this man had already delivered you. Why are you stuck there? I can begin now to walk into that newness. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am what God says I am. I'm not to be beaten. He said that I am the head and not the tail. We need to go back and review the content of our story and make sure that you're not trying to help God write the manuscript. Because I find that sometimes when I read a book, I'll start reading, oh, this is going to come next. And then to my surprise, it doesn't. I'm trying to help the story along. Sometimes you got to let the story go as it is. I also want to encourage you in those chapters of your life that don't seem eventful, be grateful. When I read the Bible, I, when I tell you, I, I, the cr book of Chronicles makes me tired. <laughs> and I just, you know, begat so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so begat so-and-so. And, -so. <laughs> and I said, Lord, this could have been a chart, like, for real. Like, I didn't need all. <laughs> just, just a chart. But then as the, the further I get into it, then I read, oh, he said that he begat. Oh, this is how this type. Let me tell you something. It's those dry periods, those dry chapters that don't seem eventful. Those are the ones that's a setup to your next comeback. That's a setup to your next blessing. Enjoy the dry chapters. They seem boring and dull. But understand that that's where God is preparing and laying out the plan to, to move you forward. Review the contents of your story. And then sometimes when you find like I, there's not a praise in me anywhere, go back and read. Go back and read. Find that chapter where God delivered you. Find that chapter where God turned things around. Find that chapter where you couldn't see a way, but God made a way. Go back and find that chapter where the people talked about you and mistreated you, but now you can't get rid of them. Go back and read those chapters. But the one thing I will say, you know, when people read your story, they don't know where the conclusion lies. But what I do want you to be encouraged to know is that because we are children of God, we know the ending of our story, do we not? We know where this story goes. And because we know who the author and the finisher of our faith is, we know where this story goes. I hate to read a book and it leaves me with a cliffhanger. I despise that. You brought me all this way to leave me hanging? I need resolution. What happens next? But I'm happy to know that the final chapter of my story has already been written. Chapter and verse. And it was written when my God and yours hung himself on the cross. 
And as he hung on that cross, he was scripting the final moments of our life. He decided the conclusion of my story. And because of his sacrifice, I know the final chapter of my story says, I won. I won. And that's what you temper your story with. It doesn't matter how bad chapter 8 was. I know in chapter 79, I win. Tell your story. Take off the dust jacket. Don't let people decide your story for you. And when people are, because you can't trust your story with everybody. That's one of the things I want to tell you. You can't trust your story with everybody. But when people inquire, tell them the truth. Tell them your story. Because I promise you there's another woman like you somewhere can't live her truth because somebody's got her held back in another chapter. Tell your story. History is not about men. It's about us all. And understanding that history is nothing but an account and a recollection of things and events that have occurred. And friend, ladies, you are history. Do you not understand that every last one of us came into this world with history? Every woman, every female that is born is already born carrying her children and grandchildren. Which means your grandmother came into this world carrying you. You are by nature historical creatures. Your life is an account. So I encourage you today and every day, take off the dust jacket and tell your story. Wow. <laughs> wow. Is all I can say. I don't know about the rest of you all, but I've really been encouraged this morning. Can we give Sister Wiley another hand? Can we thank God for this gift this morning? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we ask right now that you pour back into our dear sister, God, as she's poured unto us. God, I pray right now that you restore her for all that she's exhausted this morning in sharing what you've laid upon her heart. God, I thank you for her story. And God, I thank you for us reading it, for being inspired to tell our stories as well. God, we thank you for all that you have in store for her. Lord, continue growing her, continue strengthening her. God, continue lifting her up. And everyone that is connected to her right now, in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. I don't want to leave this morning, us to dismiss this morning without giving an opportunity for anyone who is here this morning who wants to know the story, <laughs> the real story of that promise of salvation that was gifted to us through God by the sacrifice of his son. It's a free gift. You don't have to do anything to earn it. All you got to do is accept him. And we give you this opportunity now to come to give your life to Christ, give your life to the Lord. Will there be one this morning? If not, maybe you've been wrestling with being connected to a ministry or to a church. And we're here at High Ridge. would love to have you connect to our family as we are growing in faith, relationship, and community. If you desire to join our journey, you're more than welcome to come now to the altar. Hallelujah. Everybody just bow your head. God, we thank you. No one has come, but we thank you for the moving of your spirit as we feel it right now. God, our hearts are on fire. We inspired. Hallelujah. 
to continue sharing our story. God, we ask right now in the name of Jesus that you bless those who are wrestling right now. Hallelujah. In accepting you, God, but we thank you for giving them the grace to accept you in their own time. We love you and we thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, we don't want to belabor the point, but I do want to let you all know that uh, next Sunday uh, we will have communion. I know last Sunday we, were, we had a great big blizzard that came in and just knocked everybody out. Everybody stayed at home and couldn't move, couldn't get out. So we postponed that to next Sunday. Just want to let you know that in advance uh, that our schedule will look a little different next Sunday because we will include uh, communion in our morning worship service uh, on next Sunday. I want you to be safe this week, but most importantly, I want you to remember those words. Tell your story. Hallelujah. You can stand at this time as we're preparing uh, to be dismissed. Y'all let the babies in. I think they're trying to get in. I, oh, I thought I saw somebody looking in the door. There they go. Hallelujah to God be the glory. It's so good to see everybody this morning on this beautiful Sunday, but chilly. But look at y'all, my uncle back here ushering. Look at that. To God be the glory. Already at work. To God be the glory. Father, we just want to thank you for all that our hearts and minds have felt this morning. God, we ask right now that you keep us as we leave this place, but never from your power and never from your presence. God, we thank you and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Look at somebody and tell them I love you. Ain't nothing you can do about it.